Mr. Sir, come on up to the podium here. Hello, my name is John Campbell. I'm Danielle's father and father-in-law to Travis Paul Murphy, Officer Murphy. Um, I'm kind of ad-libbing at the beginning here. I want to apologize in, a, in advance um, that any of this is taken in the wrong way. I hope that you can see that we're like a can of mixed nuts here because we're all going through things that we should have never gone through. And we're all trying to survive it in different ways. Sometimes it's not as pretty as we'd like, but we're surviving. And we have been very disciplined and respectful to this court and the justice system. And I hope that that would be taken and noted how we did this last year. And uh, just realize we're getting our vent, I guess, some of us different therapeutic ways today. I'll you know, my speech. Um, I myself, uh, I, I look at justice and so we joked about it. We called it, or is it injustice? We don't know. It is what it is. We follow the rules. We do what you requested. Try to be respectful at all times. This has all been about getting the Desmond Martinez and his life and his rights and uh, his family conditions. But there has been very little or no consideration of our family, our rights, our considerations. But here's my take all of this, and my only request, finally, will be at the end. We we're just living our lives, and then uh, Danny Desmond Martinez caused all this by murdering my son in law. He was convicted unanimously on all eight counts, and then found guilty on all eight aggravators unanimously. And then, as my son noted, we lost a lawyer for unknown reasons. And here we are. The trial got drug out for about a year. Things happen. We all lost. A son-in-law, a husband, a father, a son, a friend, and yes, a police officer that was attempting to protect and serve every one of us in the city of Phoenix. And yes, Daniel Ledesma Martinez was found guilty of murdering a person and given life and yet they only decided on murdering a police officer. How shameful is that? Because the defense drug this out for over a year, and so the jury was so miserable, in my opinion, tired, rolled into boredom, and anxious just to leave, to get the heck out of here, that I don't feel that they wanted to even deliberate and give the, the respect that Officer Travis Murphy deserved. Shame on the jury. I know you do everything by the book, Judge, but shame on the justice system for that also. I think things need to be changed, but we're not going to change it. Now my granddaughter has no father to go to school dance with, so her two grandfathers take her. She's got to decide who's going to walk her down the aisle when she gets married someday. My grandson has no father to fish with, play sports with. I ask the little questions about how do I ask this girl out or what should I do, Dad? He doesn't have that. Simple questions about life, and my daughter will never hold Travis in her arms and kiss him goodnight. And we as a family, and all of our friends, his friends, will never have the memories we deserve, ever. He said he was sorry, but I cannot forgive him. But that does not matter. He needs to ask God for forgiveness, and I hope God does, because I do not. The jury felt that life for killing a person was unanimous and agreed upon, but could not agree on killing a police officer. The mitigating factors came into their decision. And they could not agree because of his family and the way he was raised. And I feel the whole family should be responsible. And they are almost as guilty or more guilty than Danny Ledesma Bartitas is for letting this happen. Now is the only chance for the court to do this family justice and stack, add on, pile up, natural life, get all the crimes that he's convicted, he's convicted of, and put it all together so that he never gets to see the outside of the prison cell ever. Just like we never get to see Travis ever. And never have a chance for parole or release of any kind. Not just for us, not just to keep from tormenting and Torturing my family, my grandchildren in the future. But 
for all of our families and all of society. Please do not let him take any more of our time, the court system's time, or cause any of us any more pain and suffering in the future. Please end this today once and for all. Respectfully, I thank you. Six years ago, my life was shattered into a million pieces within minutes at 3.30 a.m. I lost my soulmate and my very best friend. Mary lost her only son. My children lost their father. The police department lost a brother, and so many people lost a friend. We've heard that over and over today. I can promise you that none of us in this room have been the same since May 26, 2010. I've already shared my deepest thoughts and feelings about all that has happened and how I have been affected over the past six years. The one main thing that I had to leave out was my feelings for what I want for the future. For the man that took selfish action and stole Travis's life, and in turn changed all of ours. So what I want is the absolute harshest punishment possible. Anything less would be unfair in the slightest. Nothing can bring Travis back. It hurts more than anything. But the man that took him away from all of us and took him off this earth must be punished for his actions. As a mom, my first and biggest concern is that my children will never have to worry about this awful man walking the streets again. He's a life criminal that has never strayed away from his criminal path and lifestyle. I truly believe that if he ever got, if he ever got out on parole, he would just hurt someone again. I know he claimed to be sorry and have remorse, but I do not believe that. So for those kids, Travis and I's kids, my daughter that had two years of years of memories with her daddy that she doesn't even remember unless I tell her, and my son that will never remember him, this man needs to be punished to the highest degree. Even that doesn't buy back the time and the heartache and the pain and suffering that they will have for the rest of their lives. They have a whole life ahead of them still. They will never know his voice or his laugh. They will never even get tucked into bed at night and say a little bit. But it's the best that we can get at this point. How could I ever tell them that the man that killed their daddy in cold blood with 12 rounds of a shotgun might someday get out on parole and then be a regular citizen on the street just like the rest of us? It just doesn't seem right. For Mary, she had to bury her one and only son, and those childhood memories can never be replaced. No one should ever have to bury their children, especially at 29 years old. And for me, words can't even express the loss that I have dealt with. Watching my children grow up without their daddy, so many sleepless and lonely nights, and knowing that my world will never ever be the same again, and that I might never not have complete happiness again. The only slight ray of hope and light that I have is knowing that this criminal will die in prison, and will never see the light of day again. And that is all I want moving forward for me and my children. I do not want to be back in this courtroom in 25 years talking about this criminal again. He doesn't deserve a lesser charge. We saw what he did with it the first time, and that's what got us here. He killed my husband. He deserves life in prison with no possibility of parole. Thank you, Judge Sanders, for everything. Hello, I'm Mary Beth Travis uh, Wills. Okay. <coughs> Ten years ago yesterday was one of the happiest days in my life. As I watched my son graduate from the police academy, what a proud mom I was. 
This month also marks the worst day of my life when my son was tragically killed on the line of duty on May 26, 2010. Needless to Martinez killed my son in cold blood as you hit behind a trash can and loading your magazine from your AR-15 into my son's body. You don't care one bit that you were killing another human being, let alone a police officer. All you cared about was not getting caught and going back to prison for a few more years. You should no regard or respect for anybody after you were apprehended. You behaved more like an animal rather than a human being. In fact, the majority of your life has involved criminal activity. You've had so many chances to get your life together and start living like a productive, law-abiding citizen. But you always chose to go back to a life of crime. You chose. You are Mr. Martinez, and only you are responsible for your actions. You chose to grab the rifle out of your car on May 26. You chose to hide behind the trash can left the fire on my son. You and I were responsible for deliberately killing my son, a Phoenix police officer. You know exactly what you were doing every single step of the way. And so here we are six years later, six long and painful years, six years waiting for justice. I'm disappointed in the decision of the jury. I was hoping for a death verdict, but a jury decided otherwise. So Mr. Martinez, I hope you think about a few things where you know about your life in prison. And that is, you can still talk to your kids and wife, but you have stolen that privilege from my son's children and my mother. You can still call your mother on Mother's Day. Thanks to you, I've been robbed from everyone in my son's voice again. In fact, I haven't heard my son's voice in five years. More than months and ten days. You can still visit your mom. You can still visit. Your mom can still visit you on your birthday. Well, on the other hand, you can rob the bed, Jerry. Instead, I visit his grave site, thanks to you. You can still pursue an education. Most of them can't because of your actions. You have stolen so much from all of us. Six long years without my son. There are no ways to convey how much I miss him. Life will never be the same again. All of these birthdays, other special dates are still terribly hard for me. It breaks my heart that his children will never know him. All they have left are pictures and the stories we share with them. This is something I will have to live with for the rest of my life. Travis is an extraordinary son, husband, and father. A great man, a great police officer. He was only 29 years old. So much life yet to be lived. A life cut short because of your evil actions. If there's one thing you can't steal from me, and that is the sweet memories I have of my son. Those will live on in my heart forever. Memories I will cherish till the day I die. My son died doing his job. The job he loved, the job that gave him no guarantees that he would live to see tomorrow. The Bible says no greater love has a man than to lay down his life for another. My son did just that. He loved his job. He loved protecting the streets of Phoenix. He put his life on the line so we could feel safe. He made the ultimate sacrifice. My son Travis will be forever missed. He's my hero, and he will live on in my heart always. Fred Freed with you, Judge Sanders. For a sentence of natural life with no possibility of parole, please lock up this cop killer and throw away the key. This man is not deserving of a second chance. I do not want there ever to be a chance for this man to take an innocent life again. I do not want any of us, especially my grandchildren, to ever have to consider attending a parole hearing in the future. My son paid the ultimate price. This man deserves the ultimate punishment and nothing less than the maximum sentence allowed. Anybody else that you want to speak, Mr. Importino? I don't think so. <laughs> I had one other thing I wanted to do, Your Honor. Sorry. Oh, that's it. <laughs> just one other thing, and just one last tribute to Travis. We want to play this song.
promise you that I will make sure that Kaylee and Cody know how wonderful their dad was. They have a million pictures and stories and videos, and they'll know he was a hero. I think that's everyone who wanted to see. I think the first thing is I would ask Ms. Lyles, did you have anybody that wanted to? Well, Judge, it says, I mean, you yes. No, we have no one to speak. No, no. Okay. Like they had people that wanted to address the court. You don't have any people that wanted to address the court. Okay. Sorry. All right. Then um, I'll ask Mr. Ingordino for his comments, you for your comments, and then yes. if your client wants to make any comments, he may. <laughs> Someone. Uh, if anyone had uh, participated in, in this case, if anyone had cut through this trial, um, such as yourself, and the jurors for that matter, one might think that it would be hard to imagine that I could have anything else to say. <laughs> and. Uh, I really don't have too many things to say, but there are a couple of things, Your Honor, that I, I, mean, I have a recommendation, which you know what it would be. But I think for some of the folks that are here, um, I wanted to say a couple of things that uh, might assist them in understanding um, the process and what we do. You know, I I I I, uh, I, I always I try to spend quite a bit of time um, with victims and the families and the witnesses, and in this case, in this case, fellow officers of Travis, to try to make sure that they understand, uh, you know, what we have to do and how we have to do it. And it's, it's always been interesting to me, uh, despite the many years <clears throat> that I've been doing this, that there are, there are folks who, who believe, including prosecutors, that they can sit and look at a case and a particular case and a particular set of facts and know, have a, and know that what's going to happen. I, Can we, I, I don't know if the phone line is still open or not, but I think that's where the noise is coming from. So if we can mute it, thank you. So for example, what I'm kind of getting at is, here is that someone might say to you, well, you're going to get the death penalty in this case. And I, you know, I do the best to try to exp <laughs> explain that that simply is not the way to look at it. There are still people involved in this case, family members and fellow officers, who simply are still having a, a difficult time coming to grips with what happened. And one of the things that people do who don't do this every day like we do, you know, they, they, they suffer through these trials like this. And, you know, they want to blame someone because they, they don't believe that justice uh, was served. You know, and... It, if all of us are honest with ourselves, I think all of us 
at one time or another have probably, and by us I'm talking about those of us who do this, have felt that way. You know, I, after these many years, nothing surprises me anymore. The one thing that is difficult for me, though, in, in this sort of case, is that uh, 12 people who were a member, who were members of this community, couldn't unanimously bring themselves to sentence this defendant to death. And, you know, it would be easy for me to blame, I suppose, the three people who just couldn't do it. You know, I don't know whether they would never be able to do it. I don't know whether they were fooling themselves or trying to fool us. Uh, I don't know. But, you know, a police officer who was doing no wrong who, who simply was attempting to provide safe keeping to his community was murdered by this defendant. Now you may have, I'm guessing you have your own opinions about whether he feels badly about what he did. I, I know what many people in this room think about that. About that. I, I know that I don't believe that he does. And one of the reasons that I don't believe that is because I've listened to the hours of phone calls, or at least bits and pieces of phone calls that he made while he was in jail. And I never heard one word of remorse. Not one. I did hear him request to engage in phone sex with his wife. That's what I heard. On more occasions than I wish to remember. You know what? I met with the jurors, at least some of them, and quite frankly, I, I didn't come away with a sense really of what happened and why we are here today in this situation. You know, I heard from a couple of them that there were people who felt badly because the defendant had young children and they didn't want to take those young children away from their father. My first reaction to that was, of course, as you can appreciate, well, he took Travis from his children. And I don't believe he cares about that. He could say it a million times if he did, and I won't believe him. a sense of some of the jurors that, that, that at least one of their members was not ever going to vote for the death penalty. And in talking about this, you know, I, I want to make it clear because I, I, in almost every case, and I think I did in this one, I tell them when we're picking them, uh, you know, we're, or when I talk to them, we're prepared to accept whatever you do. So, you know, if you're prepared to accept whatever they're going to do, then it doesn't seem to me to be a good idea to criticize them once they've come to their decision. Because we certainly empower them to come to whatever decision they think is right. But in this case, I have to believe, and I will always believe, that I didn't ask the right question. I didn't. And I'm talking about jury selection. You know, I didn't... Um, so many things happened, and we never know for sure who's going to make the final decisions on, the, on this jury once they're selected. We lost people along the way. And one of the difficulties of these kinds of cases, as I've tried to explain to the family, is that the end result may very well change based upon who 
is that it will last, in this case, the year. <laughs> I feel like that I didn't say something in closing because I'm still having a hard time coming to grips with their inability to see that the death penalty was the appropriate sentence for what this man did. Not only what he did, but the life that he had led. But we are here. I don't want these folks in this room to blame the jurors. Um, I just think that there are things that I could have done differently that would have led to a different result. Having said that, with respect to the sentence, you of course can appreciate the fact that, like the others who have spoken here today, a natural life sentence is the only just sentence. And um, a, a, a small matter, but because there are multiple counts that, that don't carry a life sentence, my initial impression or my initial thought was to ask you to impose all of those sentences consecutive to one another in the appropriate cases. And the natural life sentence to run consecutive to those. But as I sat here today, I began thinking about it. I don't know if you have ever been involved, you know, when you were a prosecutor with the uh, clemency board. But when someone is not sentenced to natural life and not serving a natural life sentence, they obviously become eligible at various times for that board to, to hear that request for sentences to be adjusted. And every time that someone is, and I believe this to be true, every time someone is paroled to a consecutive sentence, I, I think the Department of Corrections notifies the victim's family members. I think that's true. The point I'm trying to make here is, as was said by um, many of the folks who talked to you this morning, this family should never have to get a letter in the mail about this defendant ever until he dies, letting them know that he's dead. So what I'm asking you to do is to impose natural life consecutive sentences on the other counts, consecutive to the natural life sentence. And perhaps that will save them from getting any letters about this defendant. Thank you. There are two issues here that need to be addressed after what we've heard this afternoon. Number one is um, who are the victims? And the Phoenix Police Department and the officers of the department and the representative of the union plea and the chief's office and Officer Murphy's squad member, sergeant, and partner are not victims under the law. You see that they, in a non-death penalty proceeding, have the right to make statements about Officer Murphy and about um, their recommendations. But they're, they're not victims. And their talk of family and brotherhood and all of those things are true. And they are commendable that people who become police officers find that bond in what they do and who they 
associate with because we have to assume that people who want to become police officers, who do become police officers, are the finest of the finest. But they are not victims. The victims, as defined under Arizona law, are Officer Murphy's wife and children and his mother and the in-laws and the people who spoke today from the family. So uh, I first want to address the statements made by the police officers because I am a little shocked that they apparently do not understand the difference between justice and vengeance. Because what we heard here today was all about vengeance. Officer Detective Butcher's remarks were particularly disturbing. And she sat here in court. She knows what a trial is and what defense attorneys do. And so that perhaps we might understand the tirade from Officer Murphy's brother-in-law to get that same feelings from Sergeant Wagerman and Detective Butcher are just stunning to me. I guess they don't understand that Mr. Martinez was entitled to a defense. And under the ABA guidelines for capital cases, he was entitled to high quality defense by qualified capital attorneys. And that means that he doesn't get the defense that someone from the outside thinks he should have gotten, that he is entitled to defense that someone would want if they were charged or someone they never charged. And the fact that we fought, we filed motions, the fact that we tried our best to make this proceeding constitutional, and that then it is found that somehow it's a mockery and antics and things like that, Judge, it is just really unbelievable. But what it shows is that even police officers cannot sometimes divorce themselves from the case and the investigation into their own feelings. And I think we heard that best from Officer, from Officer Meinmeister, who felt guilty. She has survivor's guilt, and she has guilt that somehow she couldn't save Officer Murphy. Now, you know, she could be talked to until she, someone, you know, you're blue in the face to tell her she has nothing to feel guilty about. What she did was commendable. And it was, I guess, a chance that she went to the back of the house and Officer Murphy went to the front of the house. And if it had been the other way, then, you know, I mean, we can only imagine that as fine a man as Travis Murphy was, that he would feel the exact same way. But that has really no place here. That's irrelevant to what happens to Mr. Martinez for the rest of his life. And we alluded in the trial that perhaps the Phoenix Police Department should not have been investigating the death of their own. And why is that? Because they got caught up. I'm not sure if you were in court after the verdict in November, but Officer Manmeister was brought back and was in the victim room. I, I didn't see her actually in the courtroom until after. She may have been in the courtroom. And she and Detective Butcher hugged and sobbed. Detective Butcher is supposed to be the professional here. But she took this way too personally, and her, her statements today prove that, among other things. She uses the statement that Mr. Martinez gave the police department to her and to Officer Routine. And why didn't the jury ever hear that statement? Because you suppressed that statement, because four times Mr. Martinez asked for a lawyer 
And the officers involved ignored that. But she wants to use that illegal statement to get what she wants, which is, well, really, the death penalty. But that is off the table now. And she says it would not be fair to have, and Mr. Imbordino referenced that, and I believe um, Officer Murphy's brother now referenced it, that somehow a parole hearing in 25 years would be unfair to the victims, and to the family, and yet, what does everyone think would have happened if Mr. Martinez had gotten the death penalty? He would have been entitled to nine appeals. Nine times up, state court, federal court, twice maybe to the United States Supreme Court. And we now know that 60 to 70 percent of death sentences are overturned. There would have been hearings and appeals and all sorts of things. So rather than lament the fact that there's no death penalty, everyone should be kind of happy with that. Because it means that there perhaps can be some closure. Now I want to talk a little bit about, about the victims and how they are treated in the system. And you see that today. Yeah, it took a long time to get this case to trial. It took a long time to get everything in a row. You know, we lost, um, I was in a long trial. I had a death in my family. Um, Ms. Hubbard was removed. Mr. Uh, Kephart came on. We had the death of an important witness that was completely unexpected. And so, yes, there were delays. But why did it take so long? Because it was a capital case. If they had never filed for death, this case would have been over within 15 months. One appeal, if that, we'd be done. He could have pled and put an end to all of this. Really? He was made an offer. He would have taken an offer. Statement that. We don't decide if a death notice is filed. The state does. And how do they do that? They do that in consultation with the victims. And I know that when the victim is a police officer, they don't have offers. So it is not correct to assign the reason for the delay to Mr. Martinez because he wouldn't own up and take a plea. He can't, oh, he could have pled straight up. But I have a case like that right now, Judge, in PCR, and I'm going after the lawyers who let their client do that. Because he got death after he pled straight up because they didn't dismiss death. So for whatever tactical reason they had, their client just pled straight up, got death anyway. That's not going to happen on my watch. Because we had a defense of a case. Now, the jury may not have bought our experts, but Judge, the one thing that the jury didn't hear in the guilt phase, because it's not a defense, is that Mr. Martinez was impaired at the time of this offense. Voluntary intoxication is not a defense in Arizona at the guilt phase. But we know that it made some impression on the jurors in the penalty portion of this case. And how do we know that? Because we must have proved that the mitigation we presented was sufficiently substantial to call for leniency that is not a death sentence. Mr. Bredino can't figure out why the jury did this. So now I will tell him, and I will tell everyone in this courtroom, one of the jurors had a son just like Mr. Martinez. He went through the Pima County Juvenile Probation Department and knew he didn't get any help. The only reason his kid is not sitting where Mr. Martinez is right now, he told me, is because he had the wherewithal to put his kid two times in rehab program. So we're sitting here with the family that now apparently is as guilty as Mr. Martinez, according to the victims. Mom works at Walmart. Dad has picks up part-time jobs. He's always working. 
But, you know, he's pretty much a handyman. What this jury said to me after the trial was, Danny never had a chance. And so everyone thinks, well, he's got a bad record. Well, he killed a cop. Well, therefore, justice demands the death penalty. No, it doesn't. Justice is to be tailored to each individual. Justice is not vengeance. It's not an eye for an eye. Justice is to take into account the characteristics of the offender. So you have to look at the mitigation judge that we proved. And how do we know we proved it? Because for count two, it was unanimous life. So, the, and when we heard criticisms of what they all had to listen to, I guess they weren't paying attention. I, I mean, they must, they could have been here, but they weren't listening. They didn't listen to Dr. Smith, who talks about the brain, or Dr. Gurr, who talked about the brain and addiction. Danny gets out of prison, and where does he have to go? Back home. Who's living up in that map that apparently we showed too many times? But his drug dealing, drug involved, uncle is now in federal prison for drug dealing, family. You know, they say you can you know, choose your friends, but you can't choose your family. Where does Danny have to go? Because does DOC have jobs programs for people who are coming out? No. Well, they gave him yoga classes. Did they deal with his drug addiction, which they all knew about? He's 15, 16 years old, and he's begging somebody to give me drug rehab. Who knew that? So, I'm not diminishing what happened that night. But we have an addicted, drunk kid, 30-year-old, I guess. To me, that's a kid. We have him so scared he's pooping all over the backyard. And, you know, in the pre-sentence report, Detective Butcher made a written comment. Where she said, as Officer Travis refers, he said, Danny Martinez hid like a coward behind a City of Phoenix recycle can armed with an assault rifle. As Officer Travis Murphy approached unexpectedly, I think that should be unexpectedly, Martinez fired 12 times within 2.35 seconds, threatening and killing Officer Murphy. Well, now, isn't that interesting? It was either premeditated or it was unexpected. If Officer Murphy approached unexpectedly, then, you know, the jury believed it was premeditated based on the circumstances, but and they didn't believe our argument, or they didn't accept our argument in finding him guilty of premeditated murder. But what does that comment mean? <coughs> this from an officer who first wrote in her police report that Officer Murphy did not fire his gun. And yet we found out through the ballistics and one experts that in fact he did follow his gun. So, what I'm suggesting, Judge, is that you take everything that Detective Butcher said and you pay no attention to it. It's not relevant. You heard the facts of this case. You don't need her gloss on the facts of this case in order to determine what is the appropriate sentence. That's one thing. All right, now. Of the four purposes of penological theory, retribution is the one that is the most difficult to understand because retribution really is vengeance. And what you heard here today, Judge, was a call for vengeance. And what is the basis of their call for vengeance? Well, we didn't get the death penalty. Well, they 
jury don't make that decision. The jury made that decision. And they all asked for life without parole. And yet, if you recall, Judge, we asked for a Simmons instruction, and we were not given that. And the reason we weren't given that is because you assured us that you had not made up your mind and you had an open mind. And so that's why we're here today. The point is here that justice, first and foremost, must be meted out to Mr. Martinez, not to the police department. Because the second undercurrent issue here is that some lives are worth more than other lives. But there are special lives. And yet our lives are precious. From the moment you're born until the moment you die, your life is precious. Somebody loves everybody who thinks that those lives are precious. And to elevate the status of a victim, and it may be something that makes you eligible for the death penalty, which is off the table, but so let's look at what might have happened that night. Let's say that you heard the two sisters, one of them who lived down the street, was approaching the house and she's got a flashlight. And she didn't get as far as the um, east side of 1920. <coughs> but what if she had? And she was the one who was killed unexpectedly. Would we have a sea of blue here? We would not. And I doubt it would have been a death penalty case. Might have been, because of his record, possibly, but not necessarily. And so to justify life without parole because of the status of the victim and the fact that the state and the victims didn't get the death sentence that they wanted, judge um, is, is putting, is elevating the status of the victim way beyond where it should be. Now many people talked about choices, and that's always the way it's phrased. Danny had a choice to drink and a choice to get out of prison and it, all this. You know, your choices are constrained by your circumstances. And where this comes from, this choice business, is that we as human beings by what we know of ourselves. We hear about like somebody abuses a puppy, you know? And you go, oh my God, I'd never do anything like that. Every time we look at something, we look at what someone else has done, we put it in terms of, oh, I'd never do that, or, you know, boy, I can understand that. And it depends upon the perspective and your life history and everything. So when they talk about Danny's choices, Danny had no choices. And yes, the system failed him. He's in prison, and what do we expect our prisons to do? Gosh, I don't know. I'm thinking about maybe preparing them to get out of prison to come back into society. I think that's a valid thing to think. But boy, they sure didn't do that. All through his records, they know he's got a substance abuse problem, and they do zero to help it. So we showed that Danny's choices were diminished from the time of his childhood. But now, apparently, the family is to blame. You know, I, I like to think that I was born at the right time to the right family, the right, the right race. Because I was not raised in any way, shape, or form like Danny was. And maybe that's one reason why 
I went to school, I graduated, I have a profession, and my family had the resources to help me do that. So when people have some resources and then they compare themselves to someone with essentially no resources, people living paycheck to paycheck, um, and because they didn't pay for, I mean, I believe it was even brought up during the trial that, you know, the family didn't pay for rehab. It cost thousands of dollars that this family didn't have. Now, <clears throat> now Mr. Kepard and I do not want to make this all about us, but the comments that were made about our antics during the trial um, is really, it's shocking. I have never had any, um, anything like that thrown at me, and I have represented a lot of people who've done very bad things, including someone who murdered a police officer years ago. All of this could have avoided if the state hadn't decided to go for the death penalty, and we can only assume the victims were on board, or if the state had made a plea offer. So in the meantime, we have to defend our client with every tool at our disposal. Because otherwise, we would be, I mean, I, to say that we were unethical and amoral or immoral, um, that just shows that, you know, someone just really doesn't understand what a trial is and what the job of the defense attorney to, is to do. And Mr. Martinez was entitled the best that we had to offer, the best. And so, yes, we got experts. And yes, our experts truly believed their testimony that Danny, because of his eye issues and the lighting, did not know that he was shooting a police officer. The jury chose not to believe that. But that doesn't mean that we were not required to defend against every single element of every single crime which we tried to do. I need to talk about everyone, you know, the comments that were made about no remorse. Now, a couple of things. First of all, Mr. Martinez stood here at allocution and he did express remorse. And I guess nobody understands that, you know, uh, we as the defense or the defendant or anyone working on behalf of the defendant cannot approach a victim except through the prosecutors. So, how we knew that we didn't even ask to speak to the victims here is because Officer Murphy's brother-in-law made it abundantly clear every time he was in court what he felt. Mad dogging me. Um, every time he saw a family member of Mr. Martinez try to say hello or something, he, uh, you know, tattled to the deputies, flipped off Mr. Martinez more than once. So for him not to come in and expect any of his statements to get any respect because of what the system does. I'm not even blaming him completely. The system keeps the victims in the anger stage of grief until the system is done with them. There should have been some movement towards acceptance, there's no such thing as closure, I'm not going to use that word, but there should be some movement. So the anger that they are expressing here today, Judge, has been sustained by, and how do I know this, because we used to work at the place, sustained by victim witness advocates who do nothing to help victims really come to acceptance. So, 
contrary to Officer Murphy's bread and law, I do get about grief. I do get how horrible it has been for them. I worked at the Maricopa County Attorney's Office. They're mostly all retired now, but I had many friends who were police officers. I had one friend, dear friend, who was shot in line of duty. He was not killed. But I get, contrary to his views, I do get what it's like to wonder and to, uh, now in that particular case, that police officer and other members of his squad dispatched the shooter, so they didn't have to do anything like this. But um, it is wrong and selfish to claim the high ground when you shouldn't even be up there. I think you know, Sergeant Wagaman's view that we played games and antics and made a mockery of justice and ourselves. Justice is what the jury did. There is no guarantee to a verdict. There's no guarantee to a sentence. And for anyone to assume that just because there was a fallen police officer who had a tiny baby, that somehow this was going to you know, be, be it, and that they could count on it, now their anger is expressed in this proceeding when it has no place, it has no place here. Some of the, uh, I have to uh, make a comment about this. Um, Officer Murphy's brother-in-law commented on some of the evidence that he had to see, which you know, was difficult. Autopsy photographs brought on the sidewalk. We didn't introduce those, that evidence. The state did. And why did the state do that? Because it was a trial and they had to make, provide evidence of certain elements of the crime. So, and then they argued those. So yes, we saw Officer Murphy's clothing. So with his blood stains on it, we didn't introduce that evidence. We didn't bring it into court. We didn't mark it. They did. And why did that have to happen? Well, because they didn't make an offer. And why is that? Because everybody thought they were going to get the death penalty. I think I got sidetracked on the um, on the lack of remorse. He, he, he didn't testify at trial, Mr. Martinez didn't. He didn't, um, he chose not, on our advice, he didn't make a statement to the pre-sentence report, which I guess nobody understands is that when you've been convicted at trial, and are trying to preserve a right to appeal to determine if you're going to appeal, you don't make statements that can be used against you later. So, Mr. Martinez never had to make any statement to accept responsibility for what he did or express remorse. Now, he did make a statement during allocution, which, you know, you can consider as a statement of remorse. If you don't think it's remorse, and that can't be held against him because he has a right under the Fifth Amendment not to make statements. Mr. M uh, Officer Murphy's um, brother-in-law commented on how you know it's going to there is a village now for Officer Murphy's children and. Yeah, I'm not, that's a wonderful thing. The judge you heard about Danny's village during the trial. And that isn't such a wonderful thing. People in denial, people committing crimes, 
Danny couldn't get a job after he's out of prison last time, so his uncles, hey, come, some, come sell some heroin. If he'd gotten some job training, and if they'd had a job development program where they could place him, might not have happened. So Judge, his village was not the same as you know, a village that Officer Murphy's children will have. So while that is a wonderful thing for those children, it is not anything that should be held against Mr. Martinez the way that it has been described. His choices were constrained. Now we are asking Judge that you um, sentence Mr. Martinez to life with the possibility of parole and to follow the pre-sentence report which recommends that the sentences for the other offenses be concurrent because the offenses occurred on the same date and in fact, I mean, it's all part of one just, it's really one um, course of action from the um, from the hitting of the uh, sable uh, in front of um, Ms. Bailey's home until he was arrested by the um, police in the shed behind, I believe, Mr. Mendev behind Mr. Mendeville's home. So, um, Justification that everyone who spoke here today on behalf of the state is that um, Mr. Martinez has powers for which he has fully served all sentences, and the fact that um, he didn't get the death penalty. As I'm sure you are aware, Judge, under um, State versus Fell, there is no presumptive of uh, prison when the choice is life or natural life, life with parole rather or, or natural life. And so there is nothing that we necessarily have to prove to show that natural life is not the appropriate sentence. And at the same token, there is nothing that the state has to prove that life without parole is not the appropriate sentence. That is completely up to your discretion. And we believe that based on the mitigation that we proved to the jury, we unanimously assigned a sentence of life, count two, that we showed that the mitigation was sufficiently substantial to call for leniency. That his background, his addiction, what had happened that day, the drinking he had been doing, his blood alcohol at the time, the fact that they found meth in his blood, all of that is mitigating, not aggravating. And based on all of that, Judge, we believe that life with the possibility of parole is, um, is appropriate. And the fact that in 25 years, the family may get a letter from Department of Corrections saying there's a parole hearing. Well, long before that, they would have gotten letters from federal court, um, habeas proceedings, from lawyers from the Attorney General's office, and then lawyers from the Federal Public Defender's office about all of the nine appeals that probably would have happened if there had been a death sentence. So. The fact that the death sentence is still something that obviously many wanted, apparently it came without the understanding that what would happen if there had been a death sentence. And all of the post-conviction, the appeals, the post-conviction, the petitions for certiorari to the United States Supreme Court, everything that happens with the death sentence. So the fact that they may get notification in 25 years that he would be up for parole, not that he would get it, but that he would be up for parole, really, Judge, um, 
it's a spurious and uh, it's a red herring argument that does not take into account what would have happened if, in fact, there had been a death sentence. So, based on all that, Judge, we believe that life without parole is the appropriate sentence and that all of the sentences for the other counts uh, should be concurrent and, indeed, look at the plea agreement for count nine. The, that is a stipulation concurrent. Uh, so you, I think you can take from that that if that one is okay to be concurrent, why not the others? So we ask that you follow the recent recommendation as to the non-homicide counts and give life without, with parole for the homicide counts. And that whatever you do, the counts for one and two must be concurrent because it's the same victim. Does your client want to make a statement or no? No. Are you ready? Ready to proceed? Can I have your full true name, please? Daniel Lerner Martinez. Your date of birth? October 16, 1979. Based upon prior proceedings in this court, in particular the jury's verdicts in this matter, it's the judgment of the court that you're guilty of count one, murder in the first degree, a class one felony, count two, murder in the first degree, a class one felony, count three, resisting arrest, a class six felony with two prior felony convictions, count four, Burglary in the first degree, a class three felony with two prior felony convictions. Count five, burglary in the first degree, a class two felony with two prior felony convictions. Count six, criminal trespass in the first degree, a class six felony with two prior felony convictions. Count seven, burglary in the first degree, a class three felony with two prior felony convictions. And count eight, disorderly conduct, a class six felony with two prior felony convictions. All committed May 26, 2010. Um, with respect to count eight, it's the judgment of the court. I'm sorry, with respect to count nine, it's the judgment of the court based upon your plea of guilty that you are guilty of count nine, misconduct involving weapons, a class four felony committed May 26, 2010. Uh, counts one, two, and uh, one, two, and nine are non-dangerous, non-repetitive offenses under the Arizona Criminal Code. Counts three, four, five, six, seven, and eight are non-dangerous, repetitive offenses under the Arizona Criminal Code. Uh, they're all in violation of the Arizona Revised Statutes that are set forth in writing uh, in the indictment. I have read and considered the pre-sentence report that's dated February 16, 2016. Uh, I've considered all of the statements made here today. Uh, I did preside uh, over the jury trial um, that was conducted in this matter. Uh, the court does find the appropriate um, sentence as follows. Um, with regard to counts one and two, uh, for the reasons set forth in the court's minute entry dated February 22, 2016, uh, the court finds that the jury did fix the sentence at, at life in prison uh, for both of these counts. Although uh, they were charged separately for the reasons set forth in the minute entry, uh, the court uh, did find that they are the same offense. The defendant can only uh, be punished once uh, for the murder uh, of Officer Travis Murdy, Murphy and by the jurors and 12 unanimous jurors um, fixing uh, the sentence at life, uh, they precluded um, any further litigation um, with regard to count one by coming to the life verdict on count two. Um, the court uh, finds the aggravating circumstances that were found uh, by the jury. Uh, the court finds additional aggravating circumstances, including an additional prior felony conviction, uh, the defendant's criminal history, and the immeasurable uh, emotional harm uh, caused to uh, Officer Murphy's surviving family members. 
um, with respect to all of the sentences that I am about to impose, um, the court finds two mitigating circumstances, substance abuse and family support. Um, as I recite the aggravating circumstances um, for the additional counts that I will be sentencing, um, the court gives these mitigating circumstances little weight in uh, comparison to the aggravating circumstances. Uh, with regard to counts one and two, the court does find that a natural life sentence without the possibility of release is the appropriate sentence to be imposed with respect to counts one and two. And it is ordered sentencing the defendant to natural life in prison. Uh, for those two counts, the sentences must run concurrently with one another. Uh, with respect to count three, resisting arrest, the class six felony with two prior felony convictions, uh, court notes as aggravating circumstances, additional prior felony conviction, criminal history, infliction of serious physical injury, the presence of a weapon. Um, the court does, and the court finds the same mitigating circumstances throughout. Uh, the court does find that the aggravating circumstances substantially outweigh the mitigating circumstances. It's ordered sentencing the defendant to an aggravated term of five and three quarter years. Uh, the sentence in count three is to run concurrently with the sentence in counts one and two, and the defendant's to be given credit for 2,172 days of pre-sentence incarceration. Um, with regard to count four, that's burglary in the first degree, a class three felony with two prior felony convictions. Um, court uh, notes aggravating circumstances of additional prior felony conviction, criminal history, evasion of police. It's ordered, uh, court finds aggravating circumstances substantially outweigh any mitigating circumstances and that an aggravated term is appropriate. It's ordered sentencing the defendant to an aggravated term of 25 years. That sentence is to run consecutively with the sentences imposed on counts one, two, and three. Uh, with respect to count five, burglary in the first degree, a class two felony with two prior felony convictions, court notes as aggravating circumstances, uh, additional uh, prior felony convictions, criminal history, evading of police. A court does find aggravating circumstances substantially outweigh the mitigating circumstances and that an aggravated term is appropriate. So we're sentencing the defendant to an aggravated term of 35 years. That sentence is to run consecutively uh, with uh, counts one, two, and three, which are running concurrently with each other, and count four. With respect to count six, criminal trespass in the first degree, class six felony with two prior felony convictions, Court finds its aggravating circumstances, additional prior felony conviction, criminal history, evasion of police. It's ordered, again, the court finds aggravating circumstances substantially outweigh the mitigating circumstances. It's ordered sentencing the defendant to an aggravated term of 5.75 years. That sentence is to run consecutively with counts 1, 2, and 3, uh, which run concurrently with each other, and 4 and 5. Uh, with respect to count 7, Burglary in the first degree, class three felony with two prior felony convictions. A court finds as aggravating circumstances, additional prior felony conviction, criminal history, evasion of police. A court finds aggravating circumstances substantially outweigh the mitigating circumstances and that an aggravated term is appropriate. <coughs> Sentencing the defendant to an aggravated term of 25 years. That sentence is to run concurrently with counts one, two, and three and the defendants to be given credit for 2,172 days of pre-sentence incarceration. Uh, with respect to count eight, disorderly conduct, a class six felony with two prior felony convictions. Uh, court finds as aggravating circumstances, uh, the additional prior felony convictions, criminal history, evasion of police, multiple victims, and um, em emotional harm uh, to the victim, which uh, the court would consider Jillian Malmeister as being a victim of the disorderly conduct. Court sentencing, uh, court does find aggravating circumstances substantially outweigh mitigating circumstances and aggravated term is appropriate. Court sentencing the defendant to an aggravated term of five and three quarter years. That sentence is to run concurrently with the sentences imposed in counts one, two, three, and seven. <laughs> and the defendants to be given credit for 2,172 days of pre-sentence incarceration. 
with respect to count nine, uh, court finds uh, as aggravating circumstances additional prior felony conviction, uh, criminal history. That's ordered sentence. The court does find aggravating circumstances substantially outweigh the mitigating circumstances in an aggravated term as appropriate. So it's sentencing the defendant to an aggravated term of 3.75 years. Now that sentence is to run concurrently with the sentences imposed in counts 1, 2, 3, and 7, and the defendants to be given credit for 2,172 days of pre-sentence incarceration. Uh, with respect to count 9, um, so in light of the fact you entered into a guilty plea on that count, you've waived your right to direct appeal. If you would like to have that matter reviewed, you need to do so by filing a notice of post-conviction relief within 90 days of today's date. Uh, with respect to counts 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8, in light of the fact that you did exercise your right to a jury trial, you have the right to appeal uh, not only the jury's determinations, but the sentence that the court has imposed here today. If you would like to exercise your right to appeal, you need to file a notice of appeal within 20 days of today's date. We'll give you a copy of your post-conviction relief and appellate rights in writing. Uh, with regard to the issue of restitution, uh, the court will leave the uh, issue of restitution open. Uh, in the event the stipulation is not reached, either party uh, can request a restitution hearing, and the court will set a restitution hearing. Is there anything else we need to do? No, yes. no. Well, with regard to restitution, Judge, we received some uh, documents from, I believe, the city's insurance company about monies that have been already paid to Officer Murphy's um, wife. They are uh, asking for a substantial sum for future payments, and we need to know, we, I mean, we need a copy of the insurance policy. We need to know... How, long, how they made, came up with this um, figure. So if we could get copies of those things, we may be able to reach a stipulation. With regard to the uh, restitution claim by Mrs. Salazar, we have received no documentation for that. So if we could get some documentation on that or a statement that she is really not seeking restitution, that would be preferable. So... Um, if we get that information, Judge, we probably will have a stipulation, but in the meantime, we can't stipulate based on the paucity of information that we have. So if you could set a maybe restitution hearing in 45 days, Mr. Martinez is going to waive his presence, and we'll see if we can get some information from the state about the um, documentation for the the restitution, restitution hearing, if you think you'd be ready in 45 days, my experience has been with restitution hearings that they're continually continued because the documentation isn't provided. And so what I would prefer to do is leave it open, set a hearing once you're ready to go. Great. If you're not going to resolve it. That, that, that can work. Okay. Mr. Kephard and I will be in touch to see if we can get those, those receipts and other proof of payment. Other than that, Judge, we have nothing else. Anything else from the state? No. Thank you. I got my notes.